our own government is hiding the truth of what's really going on in our national parks. From missing persons to strange sightings and supernatural experiences, there's a cover-up happening before our very eyes. You're going to hear strange eyewitness stories from rangers and hikers alike, as well as other strange tales all around the deep forests and national parks. Story one is brought to us by an anonymous individual. Now they claim that this story isn't theirs, but their cousin, who has worked for years as a park ranger in the Grand Teton National Park. He isn't quite sure how to explain the sighting he had, but has confided in his cousin because he knows that his cousin is a huge cryptids and supernatural person. This story takes place in the fall of 2017. Now, his cousin and his partner patrolled the St. John's area of Grand Teton National Park for rangers going off duty. It was getting dark, and they were pulling into the ranger station, and as they turned in, they noticed what they saw was a large black thing on two legs, kind of crouched down right off the road. And whatever this was, was ripping up pieces of a deer. His cousin and his partner began to drive cautiously because at this point, they both assumed it was a huge black bear. However, once the headlights illuminated the entire backside of this animal, it was evident that whatever this was, was no bear. The cousin described it as very slender with jet black fur and long spindly limbs. It wasn't crouched down or sitting on all fours as a giant bear or a dog would. It was the way a human would be crouched down on their legs. Within seconds, this thing had turned its head to look in the oncoming direction, only for them to see half of this thing's face now fully illuminated by the headlights. The cousin is very clear about this, and he reiterated to his cousin when retelling this that he swears 100% that this was no bear. This thing's features were distinctly canine in appearance, to the T, he described. It had a muzzle with pointed ears and jagged teeth. The teeth were very long and kind of hung outside the jaws and way too many teeth for its mouth. This animal was also described as having a very deep set of eyes and an intense red color. He didn't mention anything about eye glow, etc. This creature had now turned its full attention towards the now stopped vehicle and appeared to have dropped the piece of deer it was consuming, shooting towards the tree line. One of the more disturbing details about this specific sighting was how the animal or creature used its hands as the cousin described it. It had what he could see were four fingers and an opposable thumb on each hand that had large claws. In fact, he went on to mention how they had resembled raccoon hands. It was using it the same way a human being would when they would eat something, say like a rib or a chicken leg. His cousin and his partner watched the whole thing unfurl right before them. It didn't drop down on all fours or charge the car. Its movements were much more calculated and on two legs, and its speed alone surprised both of them. The cousin also mentioned that this thing's head came above the hood of the ranger truck when it did stand fully erect and ran. They got the impression that this thing was easily six foot tall, if not taller, possibly maybe seven or eight. Now, all in all, the sighting lasted only a few seconds, and they had no time to grab any sort of photo evidence. He had clung to the idea that it was a bear for sane reasons, but the size and proportions and agility of this animal just did not make sense for that to be possible. They have both spent many time in the woods, seen many bears and other forms of animals, and have even seen animals rack to vehicles. This is far from what would be expected of any bear either of them had seen. It was obvious to this cousin that this thing had reacted almost as if it knew that it had been spotted and was doing something it should not, kind of going into hiding mode. Like me, the story submitter has a hard time believing the story without actual photographic evidence, but insists that his cousin, the park ranger, is a very credible individual and thinks he truly saw something out of the ordinary that night. The entire area around the Grand Teton National Park and the surrounding state appears to be a hotbed for other dogmen, supernatural, and Bigfoot activity, according to many eyewitness reports that I've personally received and read over the years. Why is this? 
Does it have anything to do with an ample food supply, perhaps plentiful amounts of deer, more than other places? I'll let you guys be the judge. Now, the Appalachian Trail is a 2,193 mile trail that cuts through the heart of 14 states along the eastern United States, starting in northern Georgia, ending in Maine, and taking anywhere from five to eight months to hike through. Ground broke for the Appalachian Trail in 1921 and was completed in 1937. According to statistics, more than 3 million people hike a portion of the trail each year with around 500 hikers completing the world's longest hiking trail. The changes in elevation through the trip have been equated to climbing Mount Everest 16 times and has been called the most dangerous hiking trail in the world. There have been 13 reported murders on the Appalachian Trail since 1974, with no murderer ever caught, making some of the disappearances and murders unsolved to this very day. Each year, there are reported injuries from minor to serious, including broken bones, falls, animal encounters, and human-on-human -human assaults. The trail is rated relatively safe, but precautions are still needed. Also, reported are missing people and fatalities. These are minimal, but they still happen. Brandon is a 55-year-old male who spent his younger years hiking the Appalachian Trail. He has hiked most of the trails in Pennsylvania and New York. He is a native of the area and has been hiking well since he was around 12. He has seen many strange things while walking in the woods, but was left with goosebumps on this specific hike. He was hiking a trail and had just crossed a bridge over Yellow Creek in Pennsylvania. On the other side of the bridge, he noticed a large yellow striped maple tree with a huge limb that came out at about a 90 degree angle. There was also a small green tent with a sleeping bag and backpack underneath it. The camping equipment was torn up and scattered on the ground. He figured it was a hiker who had made camp for the night and went further up the trail. He had hiked this section of the trail many times and was pretty familiar with the kinds of animals that inhabit these woods. He also knew that if a bear had taken up residence in this area, they would tear up your camp and carry off with your food and other items. He also knew that if a bear has been in this area, it would have scratched trees to mark its territory. He saw no markings of any kind on the tree near the camp. And he was camping in the exact location a week later and smelt this awful stench lingering throughout. It was a smell he could not put words to. It was the worst odor he had ever encountered in these woods. He didn't see any animal tracks, but heard something walking. It was a parched summer, so he knew it wasn't a deer, judging by the animal's weight. Brandon describes himself as a lifelong hunter and has spent the majority of his life in these same woods. He knows what a deer, elk, or bear sounds like when they walk through the leaves. But this was something very large and heavy. Brandon is 6'5", and this thing sounded much bigger than him. He heard the sound of this animal for about five minutes, and he began to notice that when he stopped moving, the sounds would stop too. Then he moved a few feet, and it did the same. He stopped again, and so did this animal. He was not one to run away from an animal, and even though he was carrying a 22 caliber rifle and a knife, this time he was scared. The smell was so intense that he could taste it. He hated to say it and it sounded cliche, but he got the distinct feeling that he was being hunted. He packed up his camp and decided to hike further up the trail another five miles to camp for the night. He set up his tent and had a fire going. The feeling that he was being hunted was still with him. He could hear something a lot bigger than a bear circling his camp. He had read some stories that mentioned a whooping sound and had heard that same noise before. It was reminiscent of a giant person running through the brush. These sounds were heavy and slow. He turned and saw a large black shape moving out of the shadows towards him. He knew it wasn't a bear because this thing moved as if it was on two legs. He shot pepper spray at it, which did not affect whatever this was. It just kept coming towards him, and he could hear it making these whooping sounds. He never saw its face because of how dark it was, and he didn't have enough light to illuminate it. But he's convinced that whatever it was, 
it was easily standing up to look into his camp. He was so scared that he lit a road flare and threw it at this thing. It just turned and lumbered away quickly, making heavy sounds as it went. Now, whatever this thing was, it must have weighed easily over 400 pounds. He saw no footprints, but the ground was too dry to leave one anyway. His dad was a farmer in this area many years ago and always claimed that Sasquatch were real. He had told his own stories to tell, but Brandon had never taken him too seriously. After this, Brandon is a believer of these encounters. Native Americans first inhabited the area before the appearance of European settlers. The Hopewell, Cherokee, Iroquois, and Powhatan all called the mountains home at one time in their own history. But the most prevalent in the area was Cherokee peoples. Their stories passed down from generation to generation, having legends and tales of conjuring, healing, and shape-shifting witches. When the European settlers came to America, they had feared witchcraft and sorcery very much due to the witch craze many had experienced over in Europe, which lasted from around the 14th to the 17th century. Those who did not fear it was thought to practice it themselves. And this mixing of people's beliefs and fears and curiosity was what set the stage for Appalachia to become this rich tapestry of mysterious figures. Now, the Blue Ridge Mountains are this setting for our first story. The mountains get their name from the hazy blue tint they project when seen from a distance. Their calming atmosphere and abundance of trails provide vacationers, hikers, and residents alike with the perfect escape from everyday life. But in Fannin County, Georgia, there is one resident specifically who refuses to leave and her presence is still much discussed to this day. Her name is Elizabeth Tilly Bradley, the Blue Ridge Witch. Now, during the 1750s, the Creek Indians lived alongside white settlers peacefully. By all accounts, there were little to no issues between the two groups. The groups were so close, in fact, that many eventually intermarried and had children of mixed descent. Two prominent families came out of these unions. One was the Stanley family, and the other was the Tilly family. Now, eventually, the Cherokee Indians moved into the area and not getting along with the Creek Indians forced them and many of the white European settlers to move out of the site. The Stanleys resettled in a place they called Stanley Gap, and the Tillys relocated only a few miles away at Tilly's Bend. The Tilly family also established a church, aptly named Tilly Bend Church, in 1858. Elizabeth Bradley, being a Tilly before marrying Jason Bradley, moved to Tilly's Bend with her husband and their eight children. Elizabeth was known to be a Creek witch doctor and was both feared and respected in the community for her magical ways and prowess, healing many in town who were ill or needed help. She served the town and surrounding areas for many years as a local healer. However, all that changed in the late 1800s when Elizabeth's family found themselves in the middle of this chaotic feud between the Stanley and the Tilly families. As it turned out, one of Elizabeth's daughters was married to a Tilly and one was married to a Stanley. Tragedy struck one Sunday morning when some members of the Stanleys snuck over to the Tilly Bend Church and let loose a rain of bullets on the building. Several church members were slaughtered, including the preacher and Elizabeth's oldest daughter. Not wanting to let this attack go unpunished, members of the Tilly family raided the Stanley settlement in the dead of night and took their vengeance. This time, Elizabeth's other daughter was taken along with her unborn child. Devastated with the senseless loss of both her daughters and now her unborn grandchild, her precious unborn gift taken from her, Elizabeth, angry, spiteful, and mourning, cursed both settlements, proclaiming that from that point onward, no child would live in either settlement. And both families went on to live their lives without much thought about Elizabeth's curse. That is, until the very first stillborn child. And for an entire year, all children born to either family never made it past infancy. 
call it a coincidence, but it's very uncanny. It took a year before the Stanleys and Tillys decided enough was enough, banding together, and the townspeople took Elizabeth from her home and marched her to the graveyard beside the Tilly Bent Church. There, they hung her from a tall tree in the center of the tombstones, and they buried her right where she dropped, ensuring she was facing west, as was the custom for witch burials. Now, before she died, she vowed to all that she would return. And when her death did not stop children from perishing, and for a second year, all the families experienced horrific losses. The townspeople decided perhaps Elizabeth had indeed returned just as she had vowed before she was killed, believing her evil spirit had possessed her sister-in-law's body and they killed her too. There is a good amount of evidence to corroborate the story. It is reported that the church still contains bullet holes from the Stanley shooting for one thing. For another, Elizabeth Bradley still rests at the base of the big tree in the center of the graveyard near the Tilly Bend Church, right where the event was reported to occur. This next story was submitted by Floyd, a park ranger who worked in Bear Mountain and encountered the strange and supernatural. Floyd patrolled the Bear Mountain portion of the Appalachian Trail in Harriman State Park, specifically the stretch from Nye Ridge to Bear Mountain Shelters. It was between 1 a.m. and 2 a.m. He was on patrol specifically to watch for bear activity since they had several bear sightings in that same area that week. He was driving a hike and patrol vehicle specifically designed to have high visibility at night. He carried a headlamp, a flashlight, bear repellent, and first aid kits as part of his equipment. He was talking on the radio with another park ranger doing a patrol in the Palisades area. The other ranger told him that he saw something flying over the road and that flew out of sight in his direction. He said, I think I just saw a flying man, with Floyd responding, what? And that's when Floyd saw what the other man had seen, a creature, a humanoid in shape, flying over the Appalachian Trail from the direction of Bear Mountain. It was flying very low, below the level of the tree line, and it was flying in a southeasterly direction. Floyd radioed back immediately to the other ranger and said, I now see it. At first, they suspected that it had to have been a person who had jumped off the mountain using a paraglider to fly over the road. But his next thought was that they had some sort of unidentified flying object in the area. He stopped the patrol vehicle. Floyd watched this thing as it flew very low, below the level of the tree line in the covered Bear Mountain Shelter area. He saw that it had wings, clearly, and the wings were bat-like in shape. They appeared to almost to be feathered or leathery, and it had the body of a man. The head appeared pointed and downward, looking at the trail, and he could now make out that it had two large glowing eyes in the dark. He saw the shoulders and arms which were also muscular yet hairy. The arms were clearly wings. They had some sort of appendage that allowed the creature to fly. He saw long extended fingers similar to a human's but exaggerated. They were clawed and the legs were also clearly defined. Now he watched this creature for approximately 15 seconds in complete shock. It flew from the direction of Bear Mountain to the direction of the covered shelter, a distance of roughly half a mile. Floyd then turned on the high beams of his patrol vehicle and shined them in the creature's direction. It then turned its head in response, looking in Floyd's direction, allowing Floyd to see its face's profile. It then banked to the right, and he saw its body profile in full as it flew over the covered shelter. He then lost sight of it as it flew in the direction of Nyridge. It was then gone from view in less than five seconds. The creature was flying very low in the area of the covered shelter, and he believed it landed in the vicinity. He then drove towards the covered shelter to try and see it. He gets out of his vehicle, looks around, and even though he was afraid it might attack him, if it had found him, but he didn't see anything. He admits feeling very vulnerable in the area after this encounter. He drove out of the area as quickly as possible, returning to headquarters. He never saw it again after that night. It was a fascinating encounter. He knows that he is not supposed to talk about this, but he is very curious about what it is that he saw. 
It wasn't a man flying nor a man with wings. Floyd believes it was some sort of unidentified flying creature. He doesn't know why he saw it, but he knows that he saw it. It's changed his perspective on things and made him question reality. A hiker by the name of Roger Caldwell was terrified after a hiking trip in 2005 when he claims that these two beings were hunting him. Mr. Caldwell considers himself an experienced outdoorsman who has never been afraid of anything in the woods before, but in 2005, he experienced something that had scared him so much he did not go camping again for almost an entire year. His claim is that while hiking the Appalachian Trail in North Carolina, during the month of October, he was deep in the woods with no cell reception and a few miles from any campgrounds. He was camping solo and had set up his tent close to the trail by a small creek. After cooking himself dinner, he went walking along the trail to get familiar with his surroundings. He states that he must have walked for about an hour when he decided to return to camp because it was now beginning to get very dark. He began to notice that it was getting darker than usual. While heading back to camp, the woods also became so dark that he immediately needed a flashlight to see where the trail was. He thought this was strange because it usually doesn't get dark this quick. Well, after walking for about 45 minutes, he figured he was about 10 or so minutes away from his campsite when he saw what looked like a large dog sitting just off the trail to his right. It was huge with large pointed ears and what he described were horns. It had its head down as if listening. As he got within 10 feet of it out of curiosity, it stood up and he could tell this creature was at least eight feet tall. Immediately, overcome with primal fear, he began to run to his campsite. And when he got within about 50 feet, he could hear this creature pursuing him, breaking branches, everything crackling behind him, and a sound of thudded footstep. Bo, 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 bo. This thing was following him. He turned and saw this animal actually physically walking on two legs, heading right towards him. Now, upon reaching his campsite, he immediately starts a fire to get the camp blazing for light unzips the tent door, grabs his handgun, even though he realized it probably wasn't gonna do much against whatever this was. He could see this thing now walking along the edge of the camp, just staying out of the light of the fire. He could see its profile every now and again as it kept circling, waiting for a weak spot. And he stayed inside the tent because he thought this thing would just rip through the tent fabric and grab hold of him. So he gets back out of the tent and now decides to sit as close to the fire as possible. This thing continued to occasionally pass so dangerously close to the fire, he began to worry that it might try to seize him. Being so close, he was able to get a pretty good look at it. He described how the front of its body was covered in fur and disgusting mangy flesh, but also appeared goat-like with horns on its head. He described its face almost human-esque, but its eyes were terrifying, like a glowing, fiery red. It kept moving and pacing around the campsite continuously over and over again. And so he'd have to keep positioning himself around the back of the fire to keep his view of this thing without scorching his back. And he could hear branches breaking and twigs snapping and just the general sound of this thing stalking him. They kept trying to approach the camp, but fire had prevented it from coming any closer, as if the light or the heat had somehow hurt it. He would hear it scream once when it got too close to the fire. And Roger said the scream reminded him more of a cross between a wolf and a human, and to describe it as purely terrifying. Now, right after it screamed, he remembers hearing a snapping sound and seeing the entire tent shake and he heard what sounded like rocks being chucked at his tent, and then in his direction in front of the fire. He began to feel even more terrified as if this was even possible at this point, like something was going to strike him at any given moment. He held his gun so tightly in his hand that I'm sure his fingers were hurting. Then he goes on to say that that's when he heard what sounded like another creature close to him just off the trail. It too was walking and snapping the foliage and making tons of noise as it approached from the other side. What he initially thought was someone coming to rescue him, he could hear heavy, heavy steps. One set was very heavy and the other was quicker and lighter. 
He noticed that one set was heavy and slow and the other lighter and quicker. The heavier one was coming from the left where he had seen the previous creature and what sounded like a smaller animal was now coming from the right. At one time, they both came into view as they passed close to the fire. He could see that the second creature was now very tall, human-like, but with reddish skin, large eyes, and also horns protruding from its head. It wore no clothing and had a very muscular, almost gorilla-like body. The first creature was more canine goat-like, but this one moved on all fours now. They came in and out of view for only a few seconds and were actually walking together, the human-like one now down on all fours while leading the other one away. They went out of sight and as they did, passed behind and left him alone. He remembered hearing them walk along the trail and then hearing everything breaking and snapping as they moved off in the distance deep into the woods. It then became deathly quiet and he now noticed he could see the stars for the first time as if it had somehow became lighter. It was then that he realized how dark it had become earlier as if enveloped by some sort of black mist. There were also now the distinct sounds of insects and night ambiance around him. He didn't move from that spot though in front of the fire the entire night. He did not get any rest and as soon as the sun came up early the following morning, he quickly packed his belongings and left. He said he didn't believe these creatures were after him. He thinks they hunted as a pack and were passing through the area when they came across his tent. The goat-like canine creature may have smelt his food or the fire and the human-like one must have followed it. They may have been curious about him in his tent, but they were more aggressive than he expected. He believed they were protecting their territory and he just happened to be in it. He thinks that what he saw could have been what is called the Cedardale monster. He has seen pictures of the Cedardale monster that had been spotted in North Carolina in the 1970s, which looked very similar to what he saw. It had a horn-like protrusion on its head that could have been its ears, possibly. The eyes, though, as he recalls, were the scariest part. They looked like a fiery, bright red, and he was terrified because they seemed so human-like, one second, and then very animal-like the next. Since that incident, he has decided not to return to the area. Clarence encountered and photographed what he believed to be were strange lights, crafts, and unexplainable phenomena, all while working at Yellowstone National Park in the early 1980s. Clarence started working at Yellowstone in 1982 as a seasonal park ranger. He was assigned to the north entrance of Yellowstone National Park, located on US Highway 89. It is also one of the more remote areas within their country's national park system. There are only two roads into this part of the park from either side. You have Highway 212 or 89 through Montana slash Yellowstone. The area is also home to the largest concentration of grizzly bears in North America, and it's not exactly uncommon for them to wander into campgrounds or even ride up onto Highway 89 looking for food. Clarence has seen this happen many times and has worked at Yellowstone from 1982 to 85 as a seasonal ranger. His first assignment was working out of the North Entrance Station. He was a seasonal ranger for the first two years and then promoted to a full-time permanent status in 84. In 85, he was transferred to the West Entrance of Yellowstone located on the 191. Here, he worked at this location for another two years before transferring back to the North Entrance Station in 87. In 88, he transferred again, but this time, it was a permanent transfer from Yellowstone to the Grand Teton National Park. He had worked at Grand Teton for another couple years before retiring from the Park Service altogether and moving to Oregon, where he currently resides. However, during his time as a ranger in his early days, things really began to happen. He went on to claim that the first couple of years were pretty uneventful for the most part. However, in 1984, he had worked the graveyard shift, which for him was about 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. at the north entrance station. One night, while he was doing his rounds, something strange happened that would change everything. It had been a pretty quiet evening. He had seen a few cars here and there entering the station, but nothing really out of the ordinary. He was walking down one of the campground loops when something caught his eye in the sky above. 
He looks up and sees this bright orange light moving and drifting across the sky. It was traveling to and from, changing shape and morphing as he came across it. It was just kind of lazily making its way across the sky. The spectacle was so incredible, he was able to take out his Polaroid and pop a couple of pictures of it with his camera. And this image is probably the best of what he has that night. He watched the object for about 10 or so minutes, maybe less, before it finally disappeared. And after that, he had to go back to work. He tried his best not to let that distract him from his work and tasks. He finished his rounds and doing what he had to do going back to the station. Well, interestingly, the following day, he got a chance to talk to a couple who had come from California who were at visiting Yellowstone National Park. They too had seen the same thing in the sky and were asking him if he had seen it too. They were quite excited about it and what they had saw and wanted to know if he had seen anything else that night. This was the first encounter of the many that would come. Clarence calls it the tipping point of all his other strange, unexplainable sightings. Most of the encounters happen outside of Yellowstone while being off-duty, but it just kept happening ever since this first encounter. Over the following year, while outside the park and mostly off-duty, he had captured a handful of these pictures. These were all taken near where he had lived at the time and varied in color, shape, size, and behavior. They would only ever appear at night, or at least that he could remember, and would often manifest and disappear randomly. Clarence would see them in the sky or on his way to work. He never knew when they would appear, but he would keep his eyes peeled for them. He's kept these pictures for a long time, but now with so much information on UFOs and pictures available, they're a dime a dozen. While he could not capture every UFO sighting that was possible, he was able to get a handful. However, these things did not stop showing up. It would keep happening and happening for years to come. Going back to his job while working at Yellowstone, he was again working the graveyard shift, the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. at the north entrance station, and would continue, again, to have strange things happen to him that just don't make sense. He went on to elaborate that, for example, he would hear strange noises in the middle of the night or see lights moving around in the trees. He would also report seeing lights in the sky and hearing strange noises just outside the station. He would go out at night and try to find the source of these bizarre occurrences, but could never find anything or any trace. He would often check the area and the roadways around the station, but never found anything out of the ordinary. It's weird that these things kept happening, especially after not being able to find a source. There were a lot of strange occurrences that continued to happen. Clarence had noted that on this particular night, the air had felt electrically charged, much the same way it does when a thunderstorm approaches and you could feel it in the air. The only problem is the night sky is clear, and he was on his way back from a campsite at night when he had stopped his patrol truck at a stop sign on the road between the north entrance and another part of the park, and he could have sworn he saw what looked like a person in a costume walking through the area's sagebrush and dirt roads. He claims that it looked so real and would stop his truck because he did not want to hit what he thought was a person dressed up in an ape costume. The problem is that there's no way a person could walk through this brush and dirt roads that fast without getting torn up. Plus, the person appeared to be too physically large. And so he watches it walking across the road into the sagebrush on the other side. He gets out of his truck to get a better look at it, but the second he steps out of his truck, it runs across the field back into the sagebrush away in the distance. That's when he gets a clear look at it with the moonlight. It had to be at least seven feet tall, judging by its surroundings. It was covered in black hair except for its face and hands, which appeared white. He didn't get a good look at its face, but it had big black eyes from what he briefly saw and large hands. He was unable to get a picture of it because it happened so fast, but it was so very bizarre to experience in person. Another encounter he had had while he was out in the eastern part of Yellowstone Lake. He was out with his truck driving during this time. It was roughly evening, and out of the blue, he began to smell what he would describe as hot garbage in the sun. This would have been impossible because there were no trash bins nearby or dumpsters, but 
the smell was only growing in intensity. And he began to feel a little prickle on his neck, like something was wrong. The feeling grew and grew, and then he sees a huge buck running out of the tree line with then what he can only describe as a giant ape chasing it. He nearly crashes his truck at the side of it, but it happens so quickly, he did not get a chance to see it for more than three seconds. And for this buck and this strange creature had disappeared. This was no more than 50 feet away from him at all times, and neither buck nor creature seemed to even care that he was there. This was only months after the encounter he had previously described with the tall man thing going into the sagebrush, and this one felt much more intense than that night than any of the previous encounters. He wanted to note that the creature chasing the buck did not appear to have any fur around its face, nose, or mouth, and he described in detail what it looked like and described it as gargantuan, around 11 to 12 feet in height, but only had hair covering its body, arms, and back, and that the face was hairless, and so were the hands. The nose-mouth area was very human-looking, and the body looked somewhat emaciated, with small, sunken-in eyes and a rather large forehead. In fact, he mentioned that its face resembled an Australopithecus, but on closer inspection, looked more similar to an early Cro-Magnon man, now, during this period, many of his colleagues had also had strange encounters they couldn't identify or make sense of. For example, one ranger he knew reported seeing a strange wolf-like creature on a ridgeline near the trees. He claimed that it was much larger than any normal wolf, and its fur was this eerie, almost translucent white. The ranger claimed that it just stared at him for a few moments before turning around and disappearing. He had another colleague of his that reported seeing what appeared to be a large black cat prowling near one of the park's lakes. The cat was so big that it was nearly the size of a bear and apparently had glowing green eyes. These colleagues of him were so overcome with a primal terror that it did not fit into any animal category. It appeared that their very presence alone invoked some kind of primal response. He's known both of these guys for a long time, and this was not a simple case of misidentification. They did not get spooked for anything. A good friend who since passed away knew a lot about the native folklore and legends surrounding the entirety of the area. And according to him, ancient magic, rituals, human sacrifice, and other various dark magic had been practiced behind closed doors long before Yellowstone National Park was ever established as a national park. Many tribes would not venture into certain areas because the bad spirits were very restless. Their superiors had told them that they were not allowed to talk about any of these things to anyone, and in doing so could cause severe liability. Anything relating to the supernatural, you just had to keep quiet and, of course, don't talk about it. But they would talk about it to each other and relate their own experiences, but that's really about it. He claimed that after watching many of my other park ranger videos, he can clearly see that it is business as usual with the national park system. Between missing persons and what's happening in these parks doesn't seem to differ too much from park to park. Clarence noted that in the next email, he will send me a lot more stories detailing a lot more encounters and more pictures during his time in Yellowstone in the late 80s. Jonathan, a park ranger in the late 1990s at the Lucayan National Park in the Bahamas, tells of a UFO encounter experienced by himself and several tourists. The Lucayan people were the natives of the Bahamas and believed that man first descended from the sky and that they were later transformed into the stars. Now, according to Jonathan, you can often see lights moving over in the sky in the Bahamas. Jonathan said he is well aware that the Bahamas lie in the area of the Atlantic Ocean and that people call the Bermuda Triangle. It is often referred to as the Devil's Triangle, an urban legend focused on a loosely defined region in the western part of the North Atlantic Ocean. Having delineated the boundaries of the triangle, starting at Miami, Florida, and then heading southeast to San Juan, Puerto Rico, and north to Bermuda, where many aircraft and ships are said to have disappeared under mysterious circumstances. He also stated that people have reported seeing giant UFOs in the area. 
There have been also multiple eyewitness accounts of giant winged beings flying in the skies over the Bahamas. But up until this event, he had never seen anything as he had described. According to Jonathan, this day started like most days in the Bahamas, a beautiful cloudless sunny day. He was on duty at the park giving a tour to some tourists at the Gold Rock Beach location. It is a stretch of white sand beach where tourists worldwide come to snorkel in the clear blue waters. As Jonathan explained as he led the tourists along the beach, it was low tide. You could walk out into the ocean for almost a quarter of a mile at low tide. He was giving details about how to snorkel to the tourist when he saw what looked like a UFO coming up out of the ocean about a half mile offshore. He shouted as he pointed up toward the craft. It was humongous. It looked to be the size of a soccer field, but round in shape and just kind of hung mid-air about 100 feet above the ocean's surface. They all watched as these beings started to fly out and back into the craft. From a distance, they had appeared what looked to be an eagle's face, or maybe it was a helmet. Their bodies appeared human-like, except that they were much larger in size. They did not have wings, though. They just seemed to be able to levitate and float in the air as they flew in, out, and around the craft. As Jonathan states, this lasted for only a few moments before the craft flew off out of sight at an incredible speed. Then, they saw more of those beings coming up out of the water from the same location and flying in the same direction as the craft had flown. Then, instantaneously, another craft had appeared. It was much smaller than the first one, but it too was round in shape. This one did not come out of the water. It just sort of appeared, and out of it came four more flying beings. These flying beings looked different than the ones they saw at first. These new beings looked like large bats or something that they had wings. The flying beings had noticed all of them on the beach because they had turned their attention towards them. Within seconds, these things were now flying at Jonathan and the tourist. Jonathan had shouted for everybody to run, and they all took off in different directions. They were all clearly terrified. Unfortunately, being on the open beach, there was really nowhere to run for safety or to hide from these things. And Jonathan watched as they flew past him just inches away from his head. He could feel the wind from their wings as they passed by. And he noticed one of the female tourists had stumbled and fallen to the ground. Just as she fell, two of these beings seemed to hover over her. And Jonathan was convinced they were going to attack her, but to his astonishment, they landed next to her and just sort of watched her as she got back up. They seemed more curious than harmful. When she got back up on her feet and began running again, they flew off. And that's when the craft came directly above them. It hovered over for a few seconds and then the four beings went inside the strange craft and it took off at an incredible speed. Now. All of this happened in a very short time frame that seemed to last forever. They had all just stood there dumbfounded, not knowing what to say or what to do. The tourist that had fallen was the first to speak. She said that she felt like they were trying to communicate with her telepathically. And that's when they knew they had just witnessed something truly amazing and unexplainable. Now, after a few moments, they had regrouped and left the beach area. Jonathan had decided to call his superiors to report what had happened. When asked if he believed what he saw, Jonathan simply says, I know it sounds impossible, but I swear it's true. What they witnessed was definitely not anything from this world. John is an Idaho park ranger who has been following my reporting for about a year now, he claims. And he works for the Bureau of Land Management at a remote campground in the Boise National Forest. It is one of the many campgrounds scattered throughout the forest for those who want to enjoy nature. The experience he's going to share with all of us has scared the living crap out of him and supposedly deals with a reptilian creature. This was back in 2016. He woke up this one morning in his campground to a sound that he can only describe as a dying animal, but much deeper in timbre and pitch. He's been here a while and knows the sounds of all the animals in the area, but this stuck out to him because it wasn't a sound he was used to hearing or had ever heard before. 
So out of curiosity, he gets out of his pickup and could tell the sound was coming from a nearby small ravine that's heavily forested with trees and brush. He grabs his flashlight and walks to the edge of the tree line since it was still relatively dark and he thought there was possibly a deer in the area and he wanted to see if he could see it or at least figure out what was going on. As he walked to the tree line, this loud scream comes from across the ravine. A scream that he can only describe as that of a woman in agony. Now immediately, the hair on the back of his neck stands straight up. And so he shines his flashlight toward the sound of the scream. And he hears the sound again, but now louder and more aggressive than before. And he could tell that whatever it was, it was like it wanted him to know that it was in charge. It sounded human, but at the same time very throaty. And there's no way a human could have made a scream like this. I mean, not in terms of volume. He has been here for many years, and this is the only time he's ever heard anything like this. He was scared, but wasn't going to let it know that. So he's scanning his flashlight around to the trees where the screaming noise was coming from, and now he could see something big moving through the trees. And he says that you could hear the trees cracking and breaking and rustling like something big is moving through them. So he's trying to follow the movement with his light, and he could kind of make out a shape now, and that's all he could really tell. There were really no details, just the outline of something very large, what he actually thought was a very large man. And then it screamed a third time, and because it was so close, he could feel the vibration of this scream through his whole body, like a loud bass stereo. He could feel that whatever it was had actually been watching him and knew that he had seen it. And he tells me, this is right when it pops out of the tree line and he sees this thing for what it is. John knows what he saw, but doesn't want to believe it. He described it as about an eight foot tall, lizardly looking thing with a very muscular build. That it had limbs like a man, but ended in clawed hands. It had this large reptilian head with these large green eyes that emitted a very subtle glow. He got a glimpse of those eyes, which scared him the most. He immediately wanted to run, but now where this thing was positioned at and where he was positioned at was actually between him and his form of escape. And as he's watching it, he could see the snout of this thing flare up as an irritation. And he wants to explain that this thing looked like something you see out of a Hollywood movie, like Jurassic Park or something. This thing knew that he was there watching it and could feel that this thing was giving off a very ominous presence, like it was some sort of alpha predator that wanted him dead. It began to position itself as if ready to charge him. Now, he explains he has never been so scared in his life, and so he starts to back away from the tree line around up the ravine, deciding the best course of action was now to run as fast as possible back to the truck, not completely sure if he was actually going to make it but he knew he had no choice. He began running back, and he could now hear it charging after him. And he could hear and see that it was running on all fours, but it sounded like a tank barreling, crashing through the woods. And he's going as fast as he can, and he could hear it crashing and breaking down small saplings as it's getting closer and closer in pursuit of him. He explains like he ran like a bat out of hell, and it stayed very close. But... He admits that even though it easily had the power to get up to him, it stayed its distance. And he could feel the ground shaking as this thing closed in on him, but still kept distance. As he was running for his life and knew he wanted to stop, he couldn't. At one point, it seemed to veer off in the brush. His mind immediately went to the idea that it was planning on flanking him. And he knew he had to move faster, just a little more and he can now hear it screaming and crashing even louder. Now it was within 10 feet behind him in the brush, and he knew it either was going to grab him or wait for him to come out of the clearing and flank him. And this is right when he finally made it to his truck. He doesn't even have time to close the door. He just jumps in, turns on the car, and floors it, because this thing is right there on him. And it actually leapt up from the ground and jumped nearly into the bed of the truck, its claws scraping along the side. He guns it, and it rolls off the back of the truck into a small ravine right near the road. I guess it was more a goalie. 
And he was so scared now, he doesn't know what to do. His hands are shaking and he's breathing like crazy. This thing leaps up from the goalie or the ravine and is now keeping parallel on all fours with the truck at about 40 miles an hour down this old road. And he could see that it's actually trying to make its way up to the driver's side door. It keeps looking at him, looking down at the door, looking up at him, looking down at the door, as if this thing is intelligent enough to be plotting to rip open the door and pull him out and devour him whole. And John knows that if he did not get away from this thing, he would not be alive to tell the story. And he is flooring it going 55 miles an hour, just pushing the truck as hard as he could. And he could see now that it was trying to leap up and actually grab at the door handle. But he was fortunate enough to be able to be swerving like an extremely drunk driver in hopes of deterring it. And once he had made it onto one of the paved roads right before, this thing leaps into the trees and disappears. Now he's scared and terrified. He didn't know what to do. What could he possibly tell anyone that they would believe him? He didn't know what to do. He calls up his supervisor once he's able to calm down and get back to a place where he can make the call. And the supervisor just tells him to go home. He tells him that he would have fill-in work for him since he was too shaken up. Now, over the next few days, he could still feel the fear, but also anger mixed with anxiety of just knowing what can exist out there. But there is something that he has never seen and claims it was no Bigfoot and it was not a bear. John also wanted to mention that for the record, he did not tell his boss that he saw a flipping Jurassic Park monster, that what he saw was a large black bear that had tried to attack him, which his boss found strange due to how scared and how he described the encounter. But John knew deep down that he couldn't tell his boss what had happened. He would think John was a nut. And he was off work for three days or so after that, and it took a long while to not have serious anxiety attacks or the fear that something was always watching him. He did his best to do what they always say, ignore it the best you can and move on with life. But there are just simply some things you can never move on from. That was six years ago now, and John's still not exactly sure what he saw because it was all too real and hard for his brain to process, but understands and accepts that it was something that defies our modern reality. What do you guys think of John's story? Bethany's encounter is a strange one. Bethany lives in Western North Carolina and enjoys hiking in the woods or walking around with her dog, Bella. She says she has always felt at one with nature and loved animals, so she was surprised at what had happened to her. Bethany was walking Bella at a local park early in the morning, around 7.30, and they were on the trail that runs along the river. All of a sudden, Bethany felt like something was watching her. She turned and looked straight up into the trees and saw a man, or what she thought was a man, sitting high up perched on a branch. She thought he must have been a park employee watching out for people and animals using the trail. She thought he was about 15 or so feet up in the tree and must have climbed up there to watch over the trail. Don't get me wrong, she thought this was very bizarre. And so she started to walk toward him to get a better look because of how strange this all is. And as she gets closer, she realized that he wasn't wearing a uniform, but in fact was naked. Bethany says she was about 10 feet away from the tree when she noticed he had no clothes and that it was strange that he would climb up a tree without anything on. From that distance though, and as she closed it in, she could see that his body was actually covered in thick hair. His face was now vaguely human, but she could make out he had a snout and his eyes were very large and were almost yellowish and he was kind of leaning forward looking at her. She was now frozen in place, couldn't even let go of Bella's leash to get her phone out to take a picture. She thought surely somebody else must be watching this because he was so exposed up in the tree, but nobody else was around. He or it leaned forward, dropped down from the tree, landing in front of her on all fours. She dropped Bella's leash and Bella suddenly bolted off, ran across the field and sat down somewhere else. Bethany said that she couldn't take her eyes off this thing. It looked at her for a moment, then leaned down and strategically began sniffing around her. It then stood up and disappeared off right through the tree line. She just collapsed right there because she was so stunned thinking, did that just happen? Did I just see that? And after a few moments, Bella came back over to her completely terrified. She had no choice but to go to her car where she sat there for a while because she was so shaken up. 
She then decided she wanted to go back to that location to see if she could find anything that might prove that that wasn't some hallucination. She explained that when she got back to the spot, looking up into the tree and looking around for any evidence, there was nothing. No torn off limbs, no tracks, or any other signs that somebody had even been there like what had just happened. But she did see some hair that looked strange. As she was kind of scanning, looking around and feeling for anything strange, she began to see this shape open up in the sky near her. And she described it being a portal where two entities came out. One of which she described looking like an older man in long white flowing robes that appeared translucent, while another looked to be a similar version of the creature she had just seen jumping out of the tree and disappearing. She immediately thought, there's no way this is happening, I must be seeing things. The older looking being had a device in its hand that lit up as he began walking toward her. Now, not only is she seeing this, but she notices that this being also has six fingers, which is an interesting note. As he or it got closer to her, the device began changing in color, and she noticed that the animal creature, whatever you want to call it, would turn in the direction the man would point the device in. It was like it was enticed or watching a magic trick. It was amazing and frightening at the same time, she describes. The man pointed the device in her direction and began to speak to her telepathically. She could not understand the words he was saying aloud, and then the device began to hum at a very low frequency, and she felt paralyzed. She watched as this levitating old man being moved around her while pointing this device in multiple directions, going on and talking to her in a language telepathically she could not understand, until at one point it began to speak English and said, do not be afraid of us, we mean you no harm. The being and creature then began to move and levitate back towards the portal where it closed up. The man and the being, by some unseen force, were now being pulled back towards the portal about six feet off the ground. And that's when she realized too that she had now been lifted off the ground, probably by that device this being had, and was now slowly being pulled towards this portal opening with them. She found herself completely unable to move her arms or legs. She tried to scream, but her mouth would not work. She was just floating there, limp in the air, moving ever so slowly getting closer and closer to this ripple in the air. It almost seemed to glimmer and give off a silvery glow alongside the outer edges as the closer she got. And as she was about to enter this portal, she said that from inside she could see a dark cavernous hallway with other disgusting grotesque beings. Upon entering, it would seem like she could see far away and there were many other beings in the distance and she could see the area they were walking through and it was worse than what she thought. The man or being, whatever he was, was beckoning her to follow him inside this portal of some kind. She then heard Bella barking aggressively and freaking out, which she was then dropped back to the ground and the portal instantaneously closed. She said she could hear Bella cowering and scared out of her mind. And by the time she had dropped to the ground, she ran back to her car without a second thought. When she got back there, she realized that her clock read 4.30. Somehow, she had been at the park for over eight hours. She swears she had thought they had been there for only about an hour when this event happened, so where did all the time go? And before she knew it, she realized Bella was not with her. She could not leave without her. So she gets out of the car again and begins to frantically call for Bella. In the height of the entire situation, she must have not realized that Bella either ran off or worse. She says that she did not come back or want to go back to the area where this portal opened up, whatever you want to call it, but she remembered that the last place she saw Bella was right then and there. So Bethany goes on to say that Bella is the love of her life and could not just leave her there. So Bethany began to go back to where this all happened, where she had saw this being in the portal, and she had said that as she made it back to this spot, she began having these vivid hallucinations, like real-life dreams of this same old man being pointing his finger at her with a device in his hand, causing her to weaken, like the life force was being drained out of her body, telling her telepathically, go now, do not come back, Bella is with us. The next thing she remembers is sitting in her car in the driveway of her home. She does not remember driving home, and her lovely Bella is now not with her. 
she kept thinking, how did I get home? How did I get home so fast? Why don't I have Bella? At this point in her story, Bethany swears she was too terrified to go back to that park to look for Bella. Which, by the way, she never mentioned at the exact national park that this happened. She could not go back to the park after what had just occurred. And since that day, Bethany and her husband have looked for Bella everywhere, but she is gone. Bethany says of Bella, she was my angel, my best friend. I don't know what happened to her, but I'm convinced those beings took her. She goes on to say that my husband thinks I'm crazy and that there's no way that some other beings could take a dog. I think it was supernatural, but he's not convinced of my story. Bella also had a collar and a tag with the name and number, so if anybody happens to find her, they would know how to contact me. I have looked all over the neighborhood for her and asked everyone I saw, but no one has seen her. She is a lab husky mix, so she would be hard to miss. Bella was loved by everybody who met her, and she can't believe that she is gone. Bethany still looks for her everywhere she goes and keeps hoping she'll one day show up. And she asks, what happened? What was the other being? Why did she go missing for eight hours and how did she get back home? She has no explanation for any of this. And the only thing that even makes remote sense is that it had to have been supernatural. Bethany fears that whatever this was will come back for her next because she believes that she witnessed a portal opening. She understands that she knows this story is completely crazy and wouldn't be shocked if she wasn't taken seriously just due to the nature of it, but she thinks that there might be some connections between what happened and alien abductions, or if there is any connection. Either way, she's gonna pursue this and try to find answers. She also stated that she once read a book that told of a portal opening by someone playing a specific sequence of notes on the flute in the woods. She is also wondering about the older looking man and what device he was using. She wonders if the man was using that device to control her or if he took Bella. She was thinking about that device after the incident occurred because she would have this horrific pain all throughout her body. Supposedly, the area where Bethany encountered this being coming through a portal was investigated by a group called Expanded Consciousness and Paranormal Research, also known as ECPAR. They had apparently used a canine and thermal imaging during their investigation. The team also made inquiries to the local authorities and checked surveillance tapes from nearby businesses. No other people were seen in the area at the time of this incident. Bella was not seen on any of the surveillance tapes either. When checking the area for torn up trees or branches, none were found. The investigators still felt that Bethany's account was highly credible. There were no unusual electromagnetic fields found in the park during the investigation either. While the investigators were in the area, Bethany was contacted and asked about any other paranormal experiences. She responded by telling them about an incident that had happened the night prior. She dreamed of being in a room with a large being and three smaller ones. The smaller ones were trying to get her attention, but she was so focused on this large one. She felt that she was in some sort of meeting. The large being turned to look at the little ones and then turned back to look at her. The being leaned in as if to tell her something, and then she felt immediate fear. This being grimaced at her, and she felt a shock throughout her body and woke up. When going over Bethany's encounter and the paranormal dream she experienced, Ekpar suggested that a supernatural portal might exist. There's no way to know if the being seen by Bethany in her dream was the same one that she experienced. The area is near a river and surrounded by heavily wooded areas. Portals or vortexes can be found in many regions all throughout the world. The being that came through the portal might have actually been an interdimensional traveler. According to Native American Indian folklore, many animals in the world apparently have the ability to shapeshift, or so it is believed. It is possible that the being seen by Bethany also possessed the ability to shapeshift. The area has had reports of other sightings as well, and there is a being that has been reported in the area for years, and not just Bigfoot. People have seen beings coming and going for years. The area is also known for paranormal activities. There have been reports of orbs and other unexplained phenomena. It is also an area where many people claim to have seen UFO encounters and other strange anomalies. For these reasons, and Bethany's credibility, 
Ekpar concluded that the area might be a supernatural hotspot. The Blue Ridge, which is certainly not the only instance of occult activity in America's oldest mountain chain. Let's shift to Adams, Tennessee, a quiet little town on the edge of the Appalachian Mountains, where the mystery of the Bell Witch still captures the attention of many. In 1804, a man named John Bell and his lovely wife Lucy, both natives of North Carolina, purchased a thousand acre farm along the Red River in Robertson County, Tennessee. They and their nine children made their way across the mountains to their new home. And this is where they lived the peaceful and quiet life of farmers for about 13 years. And then in 1817, some strange and ominous events begin to occur at the Bell Farm. It started with small happenings, little events here and there. John was out working on the farm one afternoon when he noticed what appeared to be a black dog-like creature on the property. It was not his, and it did not appear to be a friendly canine. So doing what farmers often do, he decided to take a shot at this strange creature. But to his shock, immediately upon pulling the trigger, the dog vanished right before his very eyes. And during this time, his children too complained of seeing a black dog and other strange creatures near the property. All of these figures would be there one moment and gone the next. To say they were confused by this would have been an understatement, I'm sure. The family also began to experience strange noises and sounds within the home itself. Knocking on the walls and floors, the sounds of chewing and gnawing on bedposts, and heavy objects hitting the floor. But nothing would ever be present at the sight of the noise when they would check. Perhaps scariest of all, however, was the sound of choking and strangling being made by no one in particular. The Bell family had no idea where the sounds were coming from. And for the first few years, the family being the good God-fearing Baptists they were, did not tell a single soul what they were experiencing for fear of being ridiculed. Eventually, things began to really escalate for the Bells. The children started complaining about being hit and pinched and even had the marks to prove it. The family also claimed the witch began to speak to them, telling Lucy she was the most wonderful woman, but her son, John Jr., was damned. More disturbingly, the witch spirit told Lucy that her ultimate purpose was to annihilate John Bell. The witch tormented their slaves as well, beating them and attacking them and often taking the form of a large black dog. The witch persisted with all of this and to the point that the Bells decided they need to tell people what was occurring at their farm. At this point, the haunting of the Bell Witch would be experienced by people other than just the Bells. Their neighbor, a man by the name of William Porter, decided to spend the night and just see for himself what exactly John and Lucy were experiencing. He claimed that the witch crawled into bed with him and was so close he was able to physically grab her and a fight had ensued, but the witch won. Betsy, the daughter of John and Lucy had taken the brunt of the abuse by the witch who for some reason seemed to adamantly oppose her young betrothal to the neighbor boy. Betsy often complained of abuse and was even sent away to stay with neighbors and get some rest. Of course, the witch found her. Now reports from Betsy and neighbors stated that as they settled in for the night, they heard scratching and knocking at the front door. And suddenly the door seemed to burst open and a gust of wind barreled through the house. The family sprung from their beds, lit the candles, only to find the door was closed. But they all heard a disfigured voice and it spoke, telling Betsy she should not have gone away and the witch would always be able to find her. The father, John Bell, would ultimately die on December 20th, 1820. The Bell witch was very vocal at his funeral, proclaimed for all to hear that she was the cause of his death, giving him a vial of conjured medication. After his death, the Bell Witch claimed she would leave the family in peace and return in seven years. Now, according to John Jr., she did return and spoke with him about the past and the future. She told him she would haunt the Bells for the rest of their lives. But 
that was the last known record of the Bell Witch interacting with the Bell family. The witch herself is widely believed to have been Kate Batts, wife of Frederick Batts, the neighboring landowner. Kate, as the spirit even nicknamed herself, was often accused of black magic and occult practices due to her use of bizarre language and general strangeness toward people. At one time, it was also said to be that of a Native American whose grave was disrupted by the Bell Boys. Regardless, Something or someone was tormenting the bells on their farm. Many people in the area witnessed the witchery and torment the bells went through, both as a group and individually. Andrew Jackson even visited the farm and reported his own experiences. He claimed the horses of his party refused to cross onto the property until a ghostly voice allowed them safe passage. Descendants of the Bell family still live in the Robertson County, Tennessee area, and none claim to be tormented by the Bell Witch today. But with so many people in town at the time attesting to their own experiences with the Bell Farm, one wonders what exactly went on at the Bell Farm, and more importantly, what happened to the Bell Witch? Is she still there, waiting for her next target, or perhaps she finally moved on? Michael Kaiser on Saturday, October 12th, 2019, 56-year-old expert adventure hiker Michael William Kaiser made his last known phone call to his brother before going missing in the Bear Rocks area of Lehigh County, Pennsylvania. Kaiser entered on the Appalachian Trail on October 11th, 2019 near an area known as Bake of a Knob in Lee County Township to do some hiking. The expert hiker was very familiar with the area and had told family members where he would be, even stopping to send his brother a picture of the area where he was that very day. By the next day, no one had heard from Kaiser, prompting his brother to contact authorities to report Kaiser missing. A search party assembled in hopes they would be able to locate the missing man, but initially found nothing. On October 16th, 2019, police discovered a Ford F-150 in the area's parking lot where family members told them their relative had started. The truck was determined to be that of Michael Kaiser, but he was nowhere to be found. Family members joined the search teams in the last known area where Kaiser said he was and where teams searched for days. Then, on Thursday, October 17th, 2019, an unnamed family member saw what looked to be a body at the bottom of a rocky embankment. Police later identify the remains as those of missing hiker Michael Kaiser. It is unknown if he had slipped and fell or if there was a rock slide or if he had some sort of medical event. The family thanked the police, search and rescue teams, and the community for their continued support and help searching for their loved one. There were no plans to close the trail as the death was deemed accidental and there was no threat to the public comment by police. This next story comes from a man who calls himself Kevin and had detailed his Yellowstone camping nightmare. He had went on to describe some strange things that went on with his family and his girlfriend's family back in 2002 on a camping trip in Yellowstone National Park. His girlfriend, younger brother, and the families went on a large camping trip together. The family gets up at about 5 a.m. to leave Vancouver, British Columbia, and travel roughly 16 hours down south where Yellowstone is located at. He also noted that it might be good to mention that he is from the lower mainland of B.C., around the Cougar or Rob Roy area. They had arrived at Yellowstone around 10 p.m. where they had set up camp for the night. Now, Kevin never stated exactly where in the park they were, but just that they were in the general area of the park. But if you know anything about Yellowstone is that it is huge. The families had several large tents that they would all sleep in, and they were on the edge of the forest. They had a fire going this first night and decided to all retire around midnight. The first night was fine, and Kevin claims everybody slept pretty well. He woke up around 4 in the morning to go to the bathroom and had this feeling of being watched. Not too strange, but a little uncomfortable. So he goes back to bed, wakes his girlfriend up and tells her about it, and she said she felt the same way. Little did they know, that was only a precursor of the experiences to come. Kevin tells her it was probably just a bear, and so they both just kind of laugh it off and go back to sleep. 
Even though bears aren't really a laughing matter, I think they were just trying to make sense of it. They couldn't shake the feeling, though, because it was so out of place. But anyway, the next day, they'll wake up, they get ready for the hike, they pack their food and water, then they start heading out to the nearest trailhead where their hike would be for the day. They had to hike for quite a while before they had reached the spot where their destination was at. Kevin goes on to explain it was a beautiful hike, and they had a blast. They got to this specific destination point that they all wanted with a beautiful view of the valley and had lunch. After that, the girlfriend's dad wanted to go for a walk and explore the area. So they all went with him, except the girlfriend's mom, who wanted to go back to camp and take a nap. After walking for about another hour, they came to a smaller clearing where they could get a better view of the valley. The girlfriend's dad began looking around and found a spot where he could explore further himself. So, while he was doing that, they all sat down and began talking about the view and how beautiful it was, and they were ecstatic to be in Yellowstone. Then, all of a sudden, the girlfriend's dad starts freaking out. Looking around, kept saying that something didn't feel right, that he was being watched and there were others there. He told all of them, Kevin, girlfriend, everybody, that to follow him and get out. They thought it was strange, but they kept walking for a while, and he told them they were returning to the campsite. They had to return the same way they came, so it was quite a long ways back. This is the part where things really begin to get strange. Kevin remembers on the way back feeling nauseous and hearing whispering. It felt like a psychotic episode, almost where he was going crazy. It felt very real, but his girlfriend and his brother and other family did not experience it. When they returned to the campsite, they had told the girlfriend's mom what had happened and she seemed really confused. She thought they were playing a trick on her because of what they were telling her, but then come to find out that several of them had also heard strange noises and whispering sounds included with the nausea. None of it could be explained. It wasn't food poisoning, so what else could it possibly be? It was so strange and they had a big discussion about it and decided to return the following day. But before they would go back to that hike, of course, they played it safe the rest of that day and hung out at the campsite and tried not to do too much. And of course, that night things got weird as well. By the time they had made a huge fire and hung out and talked, he remembers feeling like whatever it was that it wanted to hurt them. Kevin explains that's just the vibe he got, and he couldn't explain why he felt that. Part of him thought it was a person, but the sounds didn't sound right. The way its breathing was, how labored it was, it's hard to explain. Anyway, the next morning, everyone complained of having a terrible night of sleep and that it was exceptionally colder than the first night. On this day, their initial plans were to redo the same trailhead, but they decided to try a different trailhead. So they packed up and headed out, and on the way to a different destination, Kevin now gets the same feeling of being watched. And within a few hours in the early afternoon, he began to experience intense auditory and visual hallucinations that he couldn't even begin to describe in full detail. Being tall and having long flowing hair, but no face or facial features. He remembers being terrified and wanting to scream, but physically could not. Like his whole body had seized up and was frozen and could not move. It was strange because it felt like a dream, but he was awake the entire time. And there's times that he would look over to his brother to try and grasp whatever reality he was in. And he claims his brother had a skeleton-like face with no skin. His face was white and had no eyes. These hallucinations would come and go. And to his knowledge, there was nothing in the air that would be poisonous or could potentially cause these things to happen. This did not happen to anyone else other than him. His girlfriend would later tell him that she too would get these episodes where she would sweat really badly. Like she felt like she was in grave danger, even though they were just casually strolling through on their own hike. Nothing to be alarmed of, but she would have these moments of extreme illness that she couldn't explain beyond just simple nausea. Of course, this went on and off the entire day until that night when Kevin swears he heard something outside of their tent like the past couple nights. And what he had experienced was something far worse than either night. Sometime during the night, it sounded like something really heavy was now outside their tent. Kevin immediately guessed a bear, but 
The only problem with that is that he heard it walking on two legs. You could hear the shuffling of feet and the faint whisper sounds of a language he did not understand. The voice he described was deep and raspy. Never heard anything like it, and it scared him to death. Then, everything would go quiet for a while, and he could not sleep because of how terrified he was. He'd say no more than an hour had gone by, and he starts hearing this person, or thing, begin calling his name faintly from deeper in the tree line. The problem here is that it was imitating his girlfriend's voice, and she was sleeping right next to him. So he nudges her awake and tells her, listen. She hears the voice too, and it sounds just like her, but... It was now distorted like somebody was playing it on an old tape machine. He goes on to say that he doesn't think he's ever been so scared in his life. Eventually, the sounds stop and he doesn't recall either of them sleeping that night. When the morning finally came, her father had become very ill. Long story short, the entire family decided to cut the trip short by a day and head back. And Kevin recalls never being so happy to ever leave a place earlier in his life. While he can't exactly say this was a ghost or a spirit or even the paranormal, all these events were very strange and entirely unexplained. Hello, What Lurks Beneath. My name is John Templeton. I have been retired from the Park Service for six years now and feel that it is my time I share my story of events that occurred while I was working in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. John begins his story by explaining to us about the location he was in while on his patrol. An interesting note to this story is the number of UFO sightings that have occurred in the Great Smoky Mountain Park over the years. Let's let John tell his story. John states he was on a patrol on an ATV in the backcountry not far from Spence Field. Spence Field sits right on the border of North Carolina and Tennessee. John says it was just before dusk and he was on a small dirt service road. He was coming down a hill and had just turned a bend in the road when something caught his attention. On the other side of the road, about 100 yards away, was an unidentified flying object that was hovering about 50 feet in the air. He stops, stared, wondering if what he was seeing was true. He described it as a circular craft about 30 to 50 feet in diameter. It was metallic silver, no markings of any kind. It appeared to be bottom heavy and was rocking back and forth violently. He stated he had clear line of sight as he watched the unidentified object land on a patch of flat ground. Then, from the front of the craft, a door opened and a being stepped out. As it stood there, it seemed to look around. Now, according to John, it appeared to be humanoid in shape but very tall. From a distance, he could not tell if he was wearing a spacesuit or had an oddly shaped body or what, but it seemed to be glancing this way and that. And John said that it seemed to look right at him, and he thought he would pass out from fear that had engulfed him. He didn't know why he was afraid because he did not feel in danger, but it was just an overwhelming sense of dread. Then the being turned around and went back inside the UFO. The craft's door then closed and he heard a slight humming sound. Then the craft began to move horizontally across the road. It passed behind a clump of trees and he thought that was it, but then it came back from behind and continued moving over the road. It went over a ridge and out of sight, and he sat there on the ATV for a few minutes waiting to see if it would return before heading back to the station. When he returned, he said he wasn't sure if he wanted to report it as an incident, so he decided not to. He told a few other rangers the following day about it and no one seemed to take him seriously. His routine morning consisted of nothing more than the usual paperwork and the inspection of campsites. In the afternoon, he was on patrol in the same location where he had seen a UFO the previous day. And that's right when he had saw another one. He claims that it had landed near where he had seen the first one. Again, there was a creature standing at the door of the UFO and it sort of floated down to the ground and began to look around. Two more of these beings seemed to materialize and they just seemed to sort of levitate off the ground. And he saw three of them moving together towards the ridge. They seemed to be searching for something. John watched in amazement and he had got a call right there from the ranger station that was claiming that there are two hikers who had just seen this thing. They said it landed and he was asked to check it out. 
the coordinates were the exact same area that he was in, and he too had reported that he had a visual on something resembling exactly what they claimed. John says, just then, another thing came into view, another larger UFO, but it was circular and larger than the first. He watched as it hovered about 10 feet off the ground, landed, and yet these golden angelic beings had emerged from it and approached the other craft. One of them was carrying this strange golden object in its hand that looked somewhat like a large golden box. The four then vanished into thin air as if they were vapor right near the entryway of the larger ship, or at least where he saw one of these beings come out of. It then rose into the air and passed over the ridge. Now, John was thinking, I've got to go check this area out. And he says as he walked towards one of the initial areas and approached it very cautiously, he felt a strange sensation, electrical, and began to hear a slight humming sound, which was very faint. Because of this, he did not get any closer and felt as if he was in grave danger. This is when he debated on whether or not he should leave the area. So he got a call from his radio, instructing him to immediately report back to the station. Relieved, he got out of there. Now when John returned to the station, the two hikers who had called previously were still there and told him what they had seen. They too had seen the same craft and these strange beings come out of the ship. Of course, with John trying to remain professional, he tried to play it off as though they were joking and told him yes, he would put it in his report that there was a UFO in the area. They looked at him strangely and said that they had seen the same thing multiple days in a row. John stated that then his supervisor said he was to take him to the site where he had seen this because he wanted to verify the report. John's supervisor did not say a word to him on the way to the area, but just as though they crossed over this ridge, they saw this craft yet again. And they both sat there in amazement, jaws dropped, looking at this thing. The supervisor desperately wanted to get out of there, with John yelling, look! The other craft they had seen earlier came back over the ridge, hovering over the craft now on the ground that John suspects was previously cloaked. He told his supervisor that that was the other ship. They watched as this craft that had been on the ground began to levitate into the air and began to head in the direction of the other craft. The larger craft above it seemed to open a door from underneath, where the smaller craft seemed to be sucked into it. After that, the second ship, the larger one, took off over the ridge and disappeared completely out of sight. They both sat stunned by what they had just seen, and the supervisor said, now I know why you didn't report anything. And he strongly suggested him and John not say a word about any of this, and they agreed. Later that same day, another group of campers called the station to report what they were witnessing was a UFO landing not far from them but their location was on the other side of the ridge where they had seen the craft land. Now John's supervisor calls him on the radio and says, you're not gonna believe this, but we just got a report of another sighting. I think you should go and investigate, but keep it confidential. And if you say anything, call me directly. Don't say anything to anybody else. So he drove over to that campsite area. John mentions that the campers were two men and two women and they had told them exactly what they had seen, which was the larger craft. John decided to tell them that he believed what they had seen was something he'd like to investigate. After investigating the area where they claimed they had seen it, John could see indentations in the ground where the ship had supposedly landed, or at least burn marks in the grass. They also claimed to have seen two beings come out of the craft and disappear into the woods, and that they all felt these strange electrical sensations. How did the beings you saw appear to you? Were they walking around, looking at things, or just standing there? Did they materialize? Did they vanish? He wanted to know every detail about the encounter. He told them he would have to get their names and contact information to get back to them if they had any more questions. As he was writing the report, one of the campers shouted, there it is, as he pointed toward the other side of the ridge where they had first seen the UFO, and John looks back along with them to see a large UFO heading in their direction. They all watched as the ship crossed the ridge, then instantly shot straight up into the clouds and disappeared. John says he told them to just sit tight and would be back in a little while. He went over to his truck and called the supervisor on the radio, telling him the situation, and the supervisor told him to return to the station ASAP. 
John told the campers that he would have to file a report and that they can go ahead and stay. But they said they didn't feel safe and would have to leave the park. I mean, John cannot blame them. The supervisor at the station had asked that they keep everything quiet from now on about this, that the park administration cannot know anything about what's truly going on and to not report any further sightings. The park superintendent then issued a gag order on all of them. John claimed that he never followed up with those campers, but he had found out there had been other sightings in the area that he was unaware of. So he knows that these beings were on there on different occasions and wonders if they are still out there. And if you're wondering, by the way, this supposedly all took place between the years of 1971 and 1972. It comes from an ex park ranger who had worked extensively with the parks and recreation for eight years back in the 1980s and has two really crazy stories to share with us. Here's the first. Years ago, in the early 80s in Idaho, they had a section where there was a lot of forest fires going on. And at the time, this anonymous individual was on a fire crew in the Salmon National Forest. They got the call at around 1 a.m. that there was a fire burning about five miles from their location. They were the first crew to be called in, and they had to drive about 15 miles with their trucks and other equipment to get to the fire. They get there, and they're doing the work, and other fire crews were out working on it. Luckily, it was a minor fire, so they didn't have to stay very long. Fortunately, the fires were easily tamed, and they did not have to stay there that long. Now, very shortly, he talks about seeing something coming out of the tree line in a blight, blinding flash of light and zooming upwards towards the sky. In fact, it took all of them by surprise and shocked them. They yelled at the top of their lungs, Did you see that? What was that? Looking at each other, wondering what they saw. All they knew was that they were in a state of shock because of how blindingly bright the light was. Some of the men are even convinced they just saw an alien craft take off. They all said they saw the same thing, corroborating the exact same details. They could not believe what they had seen, and they all stood there and watched this yellow light ascend up higher into the sky, fading into a blue and then a red. Once it was out of sight, they looked back and forth at each other and knew what it was. They could not ignore the fact that they had all seen a UFO. They didn't know at first, but they all knew it was not from this planet, as this anonymous individual describes. They were all Forest Service employees, all trained as professionals, and learned that anything abnormal is not really spoken publicly. They all knew what they saw, and it was the first time in their lives, he explains that, and for the first time in all of their lives, they all saw actual aerial proof that there was an extraterrestrial craft that was either coming or going out of the tree line. Fast forward a few hours later, as the early morning hours are setting in, and again, this anonymous individual sees this large, dark shape sitting in the night sky. This one was slightly different in color compared to the night sky around it, so there was a contrast which allowed you to see it. He describes it as looking like a large gray orb, but that it was just levitating in the sky. It was about the size of perhaps a large passenger plane, but looked like an orb. It was dark gray, but almost had a slight shimmer to it, and it was kind of just sitting there in the sky. And again, he corroborates with the other rangers, and they're all seeing the same things before. So now they had just seen the blinding flashlight only a few hours before, and now this strange orb in the night sky. At this point, they're all just continually in a state of shock and awe. They were the only ones that saw this thing, apparently, because the rest of the crews out there with them didn't see anything. They're very aware that at this time, there was no planes that looked like that and could or could not have been a government craft. A couple of the guys, along with this individual who submitted the story, described seeing a similar craft in the sky two days previously back home. That they witnessed the same orb described as I just did, similar in color and size with an identical shimmer but appeared to be smaller and zooming through the sky quickly. It's written that this experience alone made most of them believers really quickly. Other strange things have also been happening all around the National Forest during this person's tenure there. One night, while out on a call, they were driving their truck and had their high beams on, and as they were driving down this road, these large orbs of light were coming out from the tree line and almost going onto the road. They had to swerve their truck to avoid hitting these because at first they assumed it was maybe a biker or somebody with a headlamp on and going around 45 to 50 miles an hour, you have to be careful. 
but these lights kind of just floated and bounced onto the road before just vanishing. They thought not only was it incredibly strange, but after quickly swerving to get out of the way, they got out of their vehicle to go investigate, only to find zero tracks or trace of anyone, but noted that the air felt full of electricity. They distinctly remember hearing this low buzzing or humming sound and that they still have no way to explain that. Natchez Trace Parkway stretches from the foothills of the Southern Appalachia to the lower Mississippi River. Visitors often stop and camp along the trail at Witch Dance. Witch Dance is said to be easily one of the scariest sections along the trail, and for good reason. Witch Dance has a long complicated history of witchcraft, occult practices, and other supernatural phenomena. Like all areas throughout the southern regions of the Appalachia and the South Natchez Trace was once home to Native Americans, specifically the Hopewell. The story of the Hopewell is a sad one. Now, according to their history, as they were displaced from their own lands, they followed their spiritual leader, who carried a bag filled with ancestors' bones and a medicine stick, searching for a new place to live. Now. It is said that they were also accompanied by a white dog. This dog would lead them to food sources all along the route. And each night, the leader of the Hopewell would find a place to stop and plant the medicine stick in the ground. One night, when he had placed the stick on the ground itself, it pointed up to the sky. The Hopewell people took this as a sign that this area of the Natchez Trace was to now be their new home. They buried their ancestors' bones in large mounds, giving them a final resting place. Eventually, the tribe would split into two. You would have the Northern Tribe, which became the Chickasaw, and the Southern, which became the Choctaw. Both the Choctaw and the Chickasaw of the region reported fearing the area of witch dance and always kept a safe distance. They claimed that before their arrival, witches inhabited the area. These witches were known for their nighttime ceremonies where they would gather, dance, and practice their dark arts. According to the natives, wherever the witch's feet touched, the grass would no longer grow. Throughout the witch dance today, bare spots can still be seen covering the ground sporadically along the trail like someone had danced around aimlessly. Most people feared these spots, but not everyone was smart enough to take heed. Now, there were two brothers known to the Natchez Trace area, the Harper brothers. The Harps were known to be evil men and considered America's first real serial killers. They often robbed, including from women and children, and would kill them for no reason. Often referred to as Big Harp, once killed a man simply for snoring too loudly. The brothers were traveling Natchez Trace, likely up to no good, when they came upon the area of Witch Dance. Their Indian guide warned them that the barren spots were not to be touched or trifled with in any way or there would be severe consequences. He told the Harps that the witches would curse the person who taunted them. Big Harp, making it known that he was not afraid of anything or anyone, jumped off his horse and in defiance, began to dance around the dead spots, laughing maniacally and mocking the witches. Now, in the weeks that followed, Big Harp's life would come to an abrupt end. Gee, as if we all didn't see that one coming. He was tracked down by a man he had crossed. And this time, Big Harp wasn't so lucky. He was killed and his body beheaded. His head was nailed to a tree as a symbol that justice, at least in the eyes of the man he wronged, had now been rightly served. The story goes that the witches got their revenge on Big Harp for his antics and mockery at witch dance. They claim his head was taken by a witch doctor and ground up to use for medicine and other potions. But they say that if you tell the story of the Hart Brothers at Witch Dance, people claim you can hear the witches laughing. Yeah. Jesse Albertine Hoover. In May of 1983, 54-year-old Texas native Jesse Albertine Hoover set out as a solo hike on the Appalachian Trail as a thru-hiker from Maine to Georgia. Hoover had read about the famous trail in a National Geographic article 
and after her husband was killed in a car accident in 82, she decided to try the hike alone. Making her way from White Settlement, Texas, Hoover chose to start the hike from Maine, which is the most treacherous part of the trail. Before leaving Texas, Jesse made several plans and an itinerary for the ill-fated trip, informing family of secluded stops for supplies and money along the way. She also contacted her physician, making plans for the epilepsy medication she would need refilled while she was gone. Against her family's wishes that she not go, Hoover had assured them that she would be fine and the trail was perfectly safe for a woman of her age. When Jesse arrived at the starting point in Maine, she would have been met with a sign from the Forestry Service warning hikers that the section of trail referred to as the 100 mile wilderness was dangerous and without services. The sign says, Appalachian Trail Caution. There are no places to obtain supplies or get help until Abel Bridge, 100 miles north. Do not attempt this section unless you have a minimum of 10 day supplies and are fully equipped. This is the longest wilderness section of the entire AT and its difficulty should not be underestimated. Good hiking. This wouldn't have been a rare decision because as many as 10% of hikers start their very journey in Maine to get the most difficult section over with in the beginning rather than wait until they are exhausted at the end of their hike. Also, aside from the terrain, elevation and weather that can impede hikers is the weight of their supply packs weight. Eight to 10 days of water, food, first aid, personal shelter, and clothing can weigh up to 35 or 50 pounds. That's the equivalent of strapping a kindergartner to your back and hiking up in elevation for 100 miles. Hoover started her hike on May 16, 1983, south of Baxter State Park. After her family hadn't heard from her in almost two months, her sister called and reported her missing to the warden service on July 11, 1983. This is when officials learned that Hoover was sorely unprepared for the adventure, having only beef jerky for food and light clothing. A search was initiated using her itinerary and talking to area hikers and a ranger that had advised the entire search team that Hoover tried to climb Mount Kittadin on May 20th, 1983, but didn't have the proper equipment and therefore was advised to not push forward. Searchers and law enforcement descended on the area, continuing to ask anyone if they had seen Hoover. A maintenance worker for the Abel Gatehouse on Golden Road, a passageway built in the early 1970s for access to the now defunct Great Northern Paper Company, stated that he had seen a woman fitting Jesse Hoover's description in late May walking towards the 100 mile wilderness trailhead. This was the last confirmed sighting of the missing hiker. The search area was hundreds of miles of trails that aren't well marked and over 15 million acres of thick, dense forest. A daunting task at best. In the over 2,200 miles of the Appalachian Trail, this is the worst area for a hiker to become lost. Authorities and search teams spent the remainder of the summer asking hikers if they had seen Hoover to keep an eye out for anything that was out of place that may lead them to her whereabouts and searching for her themselves, but to no avail. Another unnamed hiker went missing in the same area around the same time as Hoover. Search and rescue teams and police had kept a lookout for Hoover's blue backpack, clothing, gear, or anything that had belonged to her. The other hiker was found alive, however. Jesse Hoover was never heard from nor seen again. Theories of what happened to Hoover vary, but the most popular opinions are that she became lost and either succumbed to the elements and or starvation or had a medical event from her epilepsy and perished due to that. Jessie Hoover was a widow looking to broaden her horizons and get one with nature. She had never hiked such a long distance and was easily ill prepared to tackle the most challenging part of the Appalachian Trail alone. Even seasoned hikers advise against solo hiking the trail due to its dangers and potential disorientation. Weather often changes quickly in the area and can still be in the 30s to 40s for the low in May. Hikers are advised to take hiking and outdoor skill classes before attempting the world's longest hiking trail. Even then, 
hiking solo was a bad idea and should never be attempted. The Yellowstone Whispers. For hundreds of years now, the natives all over the region have spoken of bizarre noises. Even in the 1800s and before, early settlers reported hearing them. They can be described as a musical humming or even a whining sound. There doesn't seem to be a discernible source where the noises are coming. It's as if the very air itself is admitting this. There have been even more disturbing descriptions like metal cables clashing together, ethereal organ music, a mass swarm of bees, or even the strumming of a harp. In contrast, there are many different sounds and interpretations of sounds, and, and the fact that there are so many reports of hearing them is disturbing and could potentially lead to supernatural conclusions. What makes it strange is that these odd sounds are typically heard on windless days, often in winter. While there isn't a set formula to be able to hear them, people have reported them lasting up to 30 seconds and they appear between the early hours of dawn and around 10 in the morning. They are also reported as crescendoing in intensity until a sudden stop. Many who have heard them report a strange sense of foreboding and even dread. It's clear that whatever these supernatural phenomena are, it doesn't seem good. Going back to the year of 1872 was the very first written account of the mysterious noise in Yellowstone. This was the same year that Yellowstone was established, and during the Hayden Expedition, one member, the name of F.H. Bradley, had heard the sounds and could not discern what they were coming from. He described them as coming from the sky over the lake and described them verbatim. While getting breakfast, we heard very few moments a curious sound between a whistle and a hoarse whine, whose locality and character we could not at first determine. Later, in 1892, a biology professor named Edwin Linton also had wrote down his account of the strange noises while on a U.S. Fish Commission project. This is what he wrote. It seemed to begin at a distance and grew louder overhead where it filled the upper air and suggested a medley of wind in the tops of pine trees and telegraph wires. The echo of bells after being repeated several times, the humming of a swarm of bees, and two or three other less definite sources of sound. It appeared to be a somewhat faint reverberating sound characterized by a slight metallic resonance. It has not stopped there, though. A book published in 1895 called The Historical and Descriptive details of these strange, mysterious sounds. This book is a journal by an Army Corps of Engineer captain. This particular engineer, who went by the name of Hiram Martin Chittenden, was responsible for building bridges and roads within the park. This is his exact description verbatim. A singular and interesting acoustic phenomenon of this region, although rarely noticed by tourists, is the occurrence of strange and indefinable overhead sounds. They have long been noted by explorers, but only in the vicinity of the Shoshone and Yellowstone lakes. They seem to occur in the morning and to last only a moment. They have an apparent motion through the air, the general direction noted by riders from north to south. They resemble the ringing of telegraph wires or the humming of a swarm of bees, beginning softly in the distance, multiplying until directly overhead, and then fading rapidly in the opposite direction. Included were other various eyewitness accounts of these strange noises. One is a scientist by the name of S.A. Forbes, who explained that it sounded like a telegraph wire clanging together, or even voices whispering to each other overhead. He even used the term bewitching, which is disturbing. While eyewitness descriptions can wildly vary, there seems to be a continuity in that there isn't an exact source of the noise nor is it like anything anyone has heard. For any of you who claim that these sounds can be easily explained, Mr. Edwin Linton, the biology professor, claims that the sounds were quickly recognized and not likely to be mistaken for any other sounds in these mountains. Especially when you have hardened and seasoned guides like Elwood Hoffer, who described these sounds as the most strange he's ever heard in all of his days mountaineering. Now, I will say this. Having a mountaineer say that adds a lot of validity to the phenomenon. Someone who spends a lot of their life in this environment and has never heard these before, nor can they find an explanation, is downright creepy. Unfortunately, 
Chittenden or any other eyewitnesses could never find a rational explanation for what was happening. These reports had continued into the 20th century when more and more eyewitnesses would come forward in detail with their strange accounts. Geologist and chief naturalist Clyde Max Bauer wrote of these sounds in 1924, which he had described on several occasions. He told it as the humming of bees that would slowly rise and then pass overhead. Bauer also had a close friend named Jack Haynes, who was a photographer. He too had heard the noises and described it as unlike anything he had ever heard. Both of these men described it as haunting and noted that these sounds had an ethereal quality. Since the rise of technology and as the years have progressed, there have been countless efforts to try and explain and debunk the strange sounds. At around 1930, a meteorologist working with the U.S. Weather Bureau had speculated that these sounds could be temperature inversions. This is essentially where warm air above the lake sits on the cooler air on the lake surface, and this could potentially cause what he described as sound distortion. This could possibly amplify or distort far-off noises like that of geysers, for example. However, that was just a wild guess, and it does not explain the noises exactly. Also in 1930, an article published by Popular Science described these sounds to be mild earthquakes that were somehow amplified through underground caverns. In 1937, Neil Miner, a naturalist, attempted to explain what many described as the Yellowstone Whispers as simply the product of air flowing through high mountain peaks. Doing so would form powerful horizontal whirlpools of air, creating these strange phantom sounds. While these are all good theories, none of them can exactly describe and explain the who, what, when, where, and how. Of course, there have been other theories, including volcanic activity, birds, static electricity, and even wind deflected by nearby glaciers. Unfortunately, while they are all good theories, there have been no hard evidence to support them, nor could these sounds be replicated. Looking at the other side of things, the paranormal side, there are many that believe these noises are those of the victims who have drowned or the countless restless spirits of the long-dead Native Americans in the area. As described in the last story, the entire region of Yellowstone seems to have a dark, ghostly past. Is it possible that the Yellowstone whispers are related to paranormal activity somehow? Some have even proposed that the mysterious noises are directly related to an ancient civilization that had once occupied the region, or perhaps an intelligent entity or force being the source. Is it possible that UFOs could be the culprit behind these phantom oral phenomena? Like many of the other legends that exist surrounding supernatural occurrences, many are searching for answers while many others speculate. To this day, there has not been a single concrete answer that can completely explain and solve the mystery of the Yellowstone Lake Whispers. One thing is for sure though, whether it's the vengeful spirits of those who are long past, or simply natural phenomenon that mankind has not yet discovered, it is certainly strange, mysterious, and creepy. The last witch we are going to discuss in this episode is found a little further northeast in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. There is a witch there that goes by several names and still haunts the place. She is known as Old Crowface, the Mountain Maid, Bird Mother, and the Smoky Mountain Witch. Most popularly, she is known simply as the Gatlinburg Witch. It is unclear where she came from or who she was before becoming the Gatlinburg Witch, but she can most often be found around the White Oak Flats Cemetery and is typically seen wearing a black cloak and a bird-like mask covering her face. The Gatlinburg Witch is also a nesting witch, meaning she incubates objects in her body until it is time to release them, in her case using a knife. She is said to cut her own skin open and crows are released. A letter dating back to the 1800s from a man named Samuel to his friend Jeremiah is particularly interesting. In the letter, Samuel apologizes to Jeremiah for not believing Jeremiah's father when he claimed to have seen the witch. According to Sam, he saw firsthand exactly what Jeremiah's dad was raving about. 
Samuel states that while he was out hunting, he came across a woman bathing in a nearby spring. And suddenly, he reported the woman stood and walked to where her cloak lay. She reached inside, extracted a long blade. Samuel watched in horror as the woman took the blade across several parts of her skin and blackbirds poured forth into the night sky from her own body. When the ritual was completed, he said she laid down in the water and bled out while humming a peaceful tune. Scared to death by what he had just witnessed in the spring, Samuel ran back for his life to home. He also reported in the letter that ever since the event, he saw the witch lurking near the cemetery, and she always seemed to be watching him. Look, the Appalachian region is full of stories like these. This is just a handful. Occult tales and witchcraft and witches haunting the mountain ranges of several parks. Many might be passed off today as old legends, folklore, etc. But there are enough evidence and witness accounts that makes someone wonder. Are these simply just legends that make good campfire stories, or is there really more to it? I mean, did, did witches really cause the devastating incidents reported? Or is it just a coincidence? Was there something else? Or just elaborate schemes for attention, maybe? This next one was in 1986, and this person was busy clearing out a large piece of brush on one of the back roads due to a large storm that had just blew through the area a few days prior. They were short-staffed this particular season and had to pick up extra hours and duties. It was about noon, and they had been working with the crew of about three other guys for just a few hours. They were all sitting on the tailgate of the truck eating lunch when all of them see this large blackbird about two times larger than a condor flying low overhead over them. In fact, it was flying so low that they thought it might actually hit the tips of the trees, but it flew straight, then turned sharply to the left and disappeared. They all looked at each other in disbelief and asked, did you see that? They all said yes, but could not explain what it was. It was a large blackbird. Neither of them had ever seen a bird of this size. It was simply gargantuan. I mean, we're talking about a wingspan of maybe 15 to 20 feet easily. And yes, those estimates are correct, judging by how low it was flying and the fact that all three of these eyewitnesses saw it. After it disappeared, the sounds around them seemed to stop entirely and come to a halt, as if everything in the forest had now been holding its breath. Still can't explain that either. They're all just in a complete state of shock. They never saw anything like that before or after that day. The eyewitness of this story felt a little more open sharing this particular sighting, unlike the UFO one. A few people had the chance to speak about it, told him something exciting. They had mentioned to him what some people referred to as a Thunderbird. Now, he's not exactly sure what a Thunderbird is, but if it's at all what they had saw that day he would like to not run into it face to face. Some of the other guys that were with him during this time also had some interesting stories, ones that they will never tell anyone publicly. One in particular was a great guy, and they'll call him Joe. Joe told our eyewitness about this one time when he was out on a call by himself and had to check this waterline break, also a park ranger. He said it was getting dark and wanted to get this fixed before heading back. He said he pulled up to the area and got up to assess anything, but as he walked over, he heard what sounded like metal scraping behind him. When he turned around, he could see a large shape of something moving, and he said that whatever it was stopped moving when he turned around and looked. Joe, being the tough guy, decided to walk in the direction of the noise to see what it was, but when he took a couple steps to get closer, he said that whatever it was just took off running into the woods. And Joe told our eyewitness that whatever it was, was very quick, eight feet tall, easily, and covered in hair. And it left a horrible stench behind, like rotting eggs and roadkill, and cleared a small gully about 12 feet across like it was nothing. He said that from what he could tell, as it moved, it looked like a giant ape. But he couldn't know for sure. So our eyewitness had asked him if he ever saw it again, and... He said no, but now and again, he would feel like something was watching him when out in the woods. He described it as this uneasiness you just can't shake. He did have a different experience, though, when he was out with a group of guys going through the outback. He wasn't on the clock this time. In fact, it was his own personal time. And he said he started to feel that same uneasiness again, like something was watching him. 
on this particular event. This was just after the one I just told you about, so maybe by two or three months. And Joe said he got up to take a leak, and when he came back, he could have sworn that what he thought was a large tree by where he was sitting was now gone, and that what he thought was a large tree was actually a Bigfoot that had shifted and moved within the darkness. And within 10 minutes, that awful rotten egg smell crept up into their campsite. And after that, they decided to hightail it out of there for that evening. He tells the eyewitness that the guys he was with weren't Bigfoot believers at all or anything, but you could feel the tension in the air that something just wasn't right. They all agree they didn't feel safe. Now that this eyewitness is retired, he reflects on all this and wonders what exists in the woods that we all can't explain. That he's read many stories of people encountering some pretty strange things in the woods, and it really makes you think. He's a believer now, whereas before he was not. Joe has since passed away, but we will all never forget his stories and the look on his face as he told them. He describes Joe as being a man of few words, but when he did speak, you knew he wasn't lying or making up stories, that he spoke it as the truth and coupled with his own experiences that he has shared and the experience of other guys who never wanted to come forward about it, things are going on in the national parks that we don't know about. On Friday, August 12, 2011, a group of hikers on the Appalachian Trail at Cow Camp Gap Shelter in George Washington Jefferson National Forest found the body of 30-year-old Scott Lilly of South Bend, Indiana. Lilly had started his hike in Virginia on June 15, 2011, as he was a Civil War buff and wanted to camp in the area to do some exploring. He had taken the trail name of Stonewall, some speculate as a reference to Andrew Stonewall Jackson, who died as a result of friendly fire in 1863. The last time anyone heard from Lilly was on July 31, 2011, when he had climbed the priest in Nelson County, Virginia. He planned to hitch a ride the next day and re-up on his supplies in a nearby town. However, he never made it, and no one had heard from him again. 12 days after, Scott Lilly's remains were found in a shallow grave near the shelter. An autopsy would reveal that Lilly had perished due to asphyxia by suffocation, making the manner of death a homicide. In interviews conducted by authorities, it was said that Lilly had a backpack, new Ozark hiking shoes, and an Appalachian Trail handbook and a Nintendo game system that were never found. Police gave no motive as to why they think Scott Lilly was murdered. At the time of Lily's murder, there were several other homicide investigations, including the 1996 killing of the two women in Shenandoah National Park and several other death investigations in George Washington Jackson Park. Despite the best efforts of police, the Scott Lily homicide remains unsolved, as well as the Williams Winnen case. Is it possible that all these missing person cases on the Appalachian Trail are somehow related? Could there be a connection between the disappearances of Geoff and Jared Negretti? Was he murdered, and if so, why? And are the park rangers who've experienced things like the above really telling the truth? But more importantly, I want to know what you guys think. Be sure to let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to hear from you all. Also, if you enjoy Josh Turner and the Paranormal Roundtable podcast, be sure to go ahead and check out his YouTube channel. And if you're a fan of storytelling of the mysterious and supernatural, make sure to go ahead and slap that like and subscribe button for more content just like this. As always, I love you all. Keep an open mind, and I'll catch you guys in the very next video.